got excited about Noun since Rinkby. I saw it, uh, I saw its test sessions actions and I was like, this is cool for two reasons. One is like, I love on-chain art. Like on-chain art is my favorite area of art. Um, and Noun is on-chain in a really innovative way. And the way that these traits are governable is fascinating. Um, so that was really cool. And then the second um, thing about it was like, oh, it's a DAO that has revenue. That's nice in a world that, that, that where that most DAOs don't have revenue. And also on top of that, like the revenue is an ETH. Um, a lot of DAOs have revenue only in their native token if they have revenue at all. So then they don't want to spend their native token because like at the points when they should be spending more to attract more people and like sentiment is low, they're actually spending less because their token values are done. Um, it's very counterproductive. Um, uh, so I was like, wow, this is really cool. We have a DAO with fascinating on-chain art with ETH based revenue, I was like, when it hits mainnet, like, yeah, like I'm early to this and I'll be able to bid. And then the first now goes like 600 ETH and I'm like, oh. <laughs> yeah, okay. not so much. Um, now, and so it was interesting seeing like its evolution from afar um, uh, of like, oh, like there's this cool, like, you know, like, like proliferate the meme angle. Oh, there's this public goods angle. Oh, it's interesting. And like seeing that develop and that identity develop. And then I was at a dinner in San Francisco um, and I randomly sit next to Hong, Noun40, and we just like <laughs> chat about nouns for like two hours straight. Like we're so excited about it. And at the end, he's like, um, he's like, hey, Will, like I, I, I have like a noun that I want to delegate. Like, would you like to be the delegate of noun one, two, three? And I'm like, I'd be honored. Like, I'd love to participate. So then I started voting in nouns. Um, and that was, you know, fun to like be able to start to share my point of view. I have like technical expertise that is, you know, valuable to the DAO. I, I spend the most time on things where I have a unique point of view, a particular experience, or a view where I disagree with the DAO on it. Um, if everything's kind of like all voting in the same way with like 100% yes or near to it, like, you know, like I sometimes spend less time there. Like it's healthy for the DAO to have more participation, of course. Um, but um, uh, I think like in my mind, like participation is the vote and participation is the vote with reason and like my vote with reason matters more than my than my vote um so i i spend a lot of time on the ones where i can you know craft it well yo grab your headphones get ready to roll zero bar coming at you taking control we talking about now nfts and web three doing it big bringing the knowledge for free <laughs> Welcome back to another episode of Zero Pod, a CC0 video podcast about enjoying Ethereum, enjoying nouns, and enjoying life on chain. I'm Tony Hawk from the Noun Square On Chain Media Collective. My co host for today is Prof Witter, aka the Nounish Professor. And we're super excited to welcome our guest this week, one of our favorite people in the Nouniverse, Will Papper, co founder of Syndicate. Uh, we are so glad to have you here with us, Will. Um, I've always enjoyed reading your thoughtful VWRs, Votes with Reason, during my time with uh, with Announce, and it's uh, been really awesome to see your name and Syndicate's name popping up all over our feeds as uh, L3 season is upon us, and I'm really excited to chat with you about all this and more. Welcome to Zero Rights Reserved. Thank you. I'm excited to jam. One of the things we do like to do is start out with talking about the people behind the projects first and, and then dig into some of the things that you're working on. So uh, if you wouldn't mind, we'd love to hear a little bit about your professional backstory. Uh, I know you've had a, a pretty interesting career, um, a study you've, even from the time that you were studying, a, a mixture of computer science and philosophy is an, an interesting uh, combo that I want to dig into later. And, and then, uh, you know, some early AI dabblings and some just really interesting things in your career. So I'd lo love to hear a little bit about your story. Absolutely. Happy to. Um, yeah. So I um, got into the decentralization space in 2013. Um, I was actually working on mesh networks um, one summer at the MIT Media Lab. Um, and um, at the time, um, mesh networking was one big decentralized technology. BitTorrent was another, um, and Bitcoin was a third. So I was like, huh, like I'd heard of Bitcoin before. I'd been administering game servers and online communities. So I'd heard about it from those communities, but I hadn't really gone deep into the implications. Um, and um, I started to go deeper into it in 2013 and then um, built like some hackathon style projects using Bitcoin. Like one was like file verification on the Bitcoin blockchain where you could turn an address into a file hash and you could say like here's my address which would be like the list of all the files you verified um and in doing the hackathon projects on bitcoin um i saw how interesting it was but also how um brittle it was you, you were very limited in what you could do 
Um, and 2014, um, the Ethereum presale pops up. I'm like, that's super interesting. Um, I have very little money at the time. So I take my $10 Coinbase sign up bonus and I put that into the Ethereum presale. Um, if I'd put $100 in, I could have bought a house with it, but you know, hindsight's if, if 20 you, If you put $1,000 in, you'd be Patricio, but you know, we can't. Uh... <laughs> hey, we all, we all, uh, yeah, we, we all, we all have, uh, have, have hindsight in the space. You, you haven't been in crypto long enough until you have like multiple, um, I could have made six or seven or whatever figures Isn't that, here. Yeah. Uh, um, you know, Z Zeneca's, Zeneca's famous article, Infinite Regret, one of, uh, Prof's favorite, <laughs> favorite. talks about how my favorite. In poker or in in in, 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 in um, you know anything like that like crypto or whatever you're just always going to regret whatever you didn't do so don't don't dwell on it uh, <laughs> yeah yeah it, 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 you know um i'd say like uh I, i'm i'm definitely happy with um yeah how things worked out um in crypto now but there are various points i was like ah, i really could have you know <laughs> put a hundred dollars in and, and and uh and change my life um uh, many but, such cases um, all good. Yes, many such cases for sure. Many um, such you, cases. You touched uh, really quickly on on mesh networks. I wanted to just double click on that for a second, if I if I could, because I think most of our yeah. listeners will obviously understand Bitcoin, and uh, if they're old enough, they'll understand BitTorrent. <laughs> I'm sure certainly lots of us got our music that way growing up. Uh, but what what were mesh networks? I understand that they're kind of like this third pillar of of uh, decentralized uh, technology. But what, what is a mesh network? Yeah, yeah. So Bitcoin, BitTorrent, and mesh networks all fall under peer-to-peer -peer technologies. So instead of having a central server, you have devices communicate directly. Um, uh, with BitTorrent, people are communicating directly for the purposes of sharing files. With Bitcoin, um, it's for the purposes of sharing um, money. And with mesh networks, it's for the purposes of sharing data. So um, I was working on a project where it was basically these... Um, flash memory chips that were Wi-Fi enabled um, that uh, Toshiba had manufactured. And what you could do with them um, was you could um, essentially use them as these like physical community hubs, which is really cool. Um, so you could basically set these up so that um, your device would be, as you'd roam around, it would connect these hubs. It would exchange all the data you'd acquired and it would exchange all the data um, that the hub had acquired back to you. And like from there, you could have information like spread throughout like a city, like let's say it's a disaster scenario, internet connection is down, et cetera. Like you could um, have that, uh, have, have the information be communicated directly. Um, it was very early. Um, the software we were working with um, would drain your battery life um, very quickly. Um, uh, it, you'd like lose 50% of your battery life in like an hour. But um, ultimately, um, uh, some of the mesh networking concepts came in um, in terms of like Bluetooth meshes, um, which I also later worked on um, as a product manager. Um, so you uh, you end up with um, mesh networking. Uh, in 2013, mesh networking was way too early. Um, now it's started to um, emerge more. Um, likewise, like was an AI pre um, chat GPT. Um, I was going to ask crypto. you about that was in 2018. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm used to seeing things develop over, you know, five years or so. You're used to being early. It's a, a good thing used to, to be. being early. Yeah. Very early. Yes. Yes. <laughs> timing is timing is hard. Um, uh, with syndicate, we came up with the idea in 2018 and we set it aside for a few years because we knew it was wow. too early, but, um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. We've already been early to AI. Let's, uh, let's wait a little bit on this one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, you yeah, you were telling us your story. You talked a little bit about Bitcoin. You talked about Ethereum and the presale. Uh, what attracted you to Ethereum, and and where did your story go from there? Yeah, so when I was doing these Bitcoin prototypes, I was like, you're very limited in what you can do. Um, like it would be amazing if I could just write code and have that code run instead of needing to do all these really hacky things with Bitcoin addresses. Um, Which and they're still the doing Ethereum. to this day. <laughs> yes, right. yes. Or or no, um, it's got a, a little better, a little better. Yes, ordinals is is closer. Um, uh, but yeah, it's something where um, the Ethereum white paper. I was just immediately found it absolutely fascinating. It was like, wow, you have this global computer that can run code that's Turing complete. I was like, I have no idea how they'll ever make that secure. But that's really interesting, regardless, um, because at the time, the idea of like running this code across so many machines seemed insane. It seemed like there must be a security vulnerability. Somewhere in there, no way can you build a full programming language on the blockchain. Um, and a lot of people doubted Ethereum um, for that reason. It was like, there's no way that they can pull this off in a way that um, 
that 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 doesn't introduce vulnerabilities where like the code will escape and you know like place viruses on the host machine. I remember hearing that in the context of like being early to Ethereum and people being like, you have to also understand like at the time Ethereum was coming out, there were also many other you know prototypes of different chains and things that were being worked on, and many of those never saw the light of day. So I mean, it's easy to say, oh, I would have been early to Ethereum, but you know, Ethereum's success wasn't guaranteed by any any stretch, right? Yeah, and one thing one thing I'd recommend for people who are um, from later crypto cycles is go to Coin Market Cap or Coin Gecko, and you can check the history by year and just go back to like 2013, 2014, 2015, 2017. The only things that survive between cycles for the most part are Bitcoin and Ethereum. 2017, there's a few things that survive between cycles, but um, yeah. Like XRP for like, some reason. Yeah, yeah, that too. Um, and Cardano and yeah, a few others. Um, but um, yeah, everyone thought that EOS was what um, Solana would be, um, you know, and there were bets on that in 2017. If you thought decentralized naming would be big, well, great. You could have made a super early bet a decade ago in Namecoin, um, which, uh, which, which uh, you know, didn't pan out in the exact same way as ENS, um, but is still very interesting nonetheless. If you thought on-chain social was going to be big, you could have bet on Steemit in 2017, um, which was my barometer of the 2017 bull market mania because Steemit, which was a Reddit clone, was worth more than Reddit um, in 2017 um, with like 1,000 users. Yeah, yeah, it was wild. Um, now that's Warpcast and um, the whole Farcaster ecosystem. But um, yeah, seeing crypto go through these cycles of like too early, too early, too early, and then timing's right, and then it works um, is fascinating. Um, and Ethereum, uh, at the time I wanted to learn, it wasn't even Solidity. There were like three different programming language proposals. One was JavaScript inspired, one was Python inspired, one was Go inspired. Um, and we were kind of all in a group chat. There was like 200, a 200 person Skype group chat for people who wanted to learn Solidity specifically. None of the tooling was there yet. Um, like people didn't know about things like redundancy attacks and um, the DAO hack was like a result of like Solidity knowledge still being quite early. Um, uh, but um, yeah, uh, in 2016, I thought DAOs would be big and that took a few years too. <laughs> so timing is, is very hard to get right. <laughs> That's just amazing. I'm 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 thinking back to 2017 for me was when I kind of came into the space and my first purchase was Ethereum to buy CryptoKitties. So I was NFT native, if you will, but that was too early also. <laughs> so now we have I bought a lovely bunch crypto of great kitties just littering NFTs. littering our wallets. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, we call them historical NFTs. That. That's right. <laughs> historical <laughs> NFTs is what too. we call them. To avoid calling them hysterical <laughs> NFTs because they... Uh, exactly, exactly, it. exactly. Um, but that's amazing to hear your, you know, just your um, recognition of some of these things so early. And what really got me was when you said you were in a group chat with 200 people trying to figure out how to learn Solidity. And a that's Skype like, group chat. That's wild. Which really dates that's it. Wild. A Skype <laughs> yeah, group yeah. chat. That's wild. Skype also really too early, wild. apparently. Yeah. Too early also. Yes, yeah. too early. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. Um, so I, one thing I teach a class me, in blockchain yeah. and the way that I, um, the way that I suggest that students learn if they want to learn solidity is to use crypto zombies, which is probably mm, way yeah. before that you were probably doing that way before that even existed. So it's, it's amazing to hear this. It, it, it was, it was a really fun time. Like one thing about me is that I, I'm very averse to hype cycles. If something gets hyped, I'm very skeptical of it. Um, uh, because usually in inflation uh, expectations are way too inflated um, and it's just like it's not going to meet reality so then 2017 happened in crypto and I was like okay like you know steam it is worth more than reddit Dentacoin is huge which was a coin for dentists um, it makes about as much sense as you'd think um, uh, there were all I these blockchains that completely. that's funny that's when uh, <laughs> that's, really that's funny. when you know a, a cycle is getting a little long in the tooth I'm sorry <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> I didn't even see yeah, that one coming. I should have. <laughs> yeah, there are all these things of like, oh, it's Ethereum, but we use this programming language or, oh, it's Ethereum, but for China or like all these kinds of derivatives. And I was like, OK, this space is like super, super overheated. What's not sexy right now? AI. No one cares about AI. It was like the depths of like the like natural language processing um, bust, like there was no real machine learning being done anywhere. Um, uh, everyone was using um, like people to do labeling or like simple heuristic algorithms. Um, so we were like, hey, like 
let's start a documentation search company where you can put all of your documentation um, onto um, your like ingest it all into a service and then that documentation is easily searchable um we had some r d funding to go and do that and this is um, a librarian ai is that yes exactly um yeah a small amount of r d funding but you know enough to enough to uh, sustain us for our research and we basically said okay like let's try a bunch of these cutting edge machine learning techniques um and let's try it on an open source data set so we actually use the ethereum uh chat logs um, as our testing data set. So I was asking it questions about Ethereum um, to see how well it would do because it was like a company chat that you know was accessible um, to the public. Um, and uh, uh, we basically um, had a simple heuristic algorithm. It's known as TFIDF. Um, it's a pretty good search algorithm, which basically um, just says words that uh, often, words that, words that um, appear together with many other words are probably low signal. Words that only appear together in specific contexts are probably very high signal. Um, so if you it's like you're measuring see... the super, you're measuring like the super, super fluidity or superfluousness of a word. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like how how specialized or not is its context? So like if you see noun and adjective together, probably not super high signal. If you see noun and doubt together, probably super high signal because that occurs together much more rarely than noun and adjective. Um, uh, so we, 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 we were testing against TFIDF, then we were translating a bunch of cutting edge concepts from academic papers to try to outperform it. None of them outperformed it. Um, not, nothing outperformed, um, this very simple algorithm, um, which is true for the whole space at the time. No one was outperforming, um, these things. So we we're like, huh, okay. Um, like we we're like, that's interesting research that like all this cutting edge machine learning can't beat, um, these simple heuristics. Um, okay. Well, yet, yet. Um, so then, uh, you know, uh, wait five years and you have ChatGPT. Um, but, uh, but yeah, at the time it was very interesting because um, uh, that was an area that had already gone through its hype bust. Um, and, uh, and like, I kind of saw like that the people building in it were super dedicated, were really interesting. And um, uh, then uh, 2018 happens, the crypto bust happens and like, it was 2018 was my favorite time in crypto, like by far, like the best year in crypto because people had become aware of crypto. People had um, started to have some expectations around it, but like they knew it was too early. They knew there was a lot that needed to be done. Um, and uh, the people who were left were incredibly dedicated. So I was hanging out at IDEO Collab, um, which is where I met my co-founder, Ian, um, in 2018. IDEO is a design firm and the Collab is their R&D group. And it was just a bunch of people in 2018 building in the depths of the bear market, just like, oh, yeah, what are these things called NFTs? These are super cool. Like, what are these things um, called like on-chain social? Can we make like on-chain messaging? Um, uh, a bunch of really interesting projects like that. Um, What's your favorite one that you worked on? Can you pick just one that you worked on at IDEO? Um, I mean, uh, I think, um, one of the projects that, um, stands out most to me, um, was, um, uh, it actually, so we did, a, we did, we did, um, projects in crypto. We also did projects out of crypto. Um, one thing that I did for their hackathon actually, um, which is how I got involved with them in the first place was participating in the hackathon. I built this, um, uh, haptic, uh, prototype for haptic, um, tooling where essentially um, uh, instead of uh, like if you were scrolling on a screen and you had low vision um, but not no vision um, we could make the phone vibrate for like different areas that you're supposed to click so like you could run your um, finger down the screen and you would you know vibrate when it gets to a button um, text would ideally in theory have a different feel um, than like interactive elements things like that which is kind of like a sense of um I think like in many ways that made me interested in cryptos applications, consumer use cases, because I was like, wow, like you combine these like fundamental primitives of crypto being interoperable alongside a lot of interesting interaction paradigms, whether that's AR, whether that's, um, uh, you know, gaming, whether that's social and like you take crypto and you combine it with really interesting user experience. And I hope that that's how the industry succeeds. I think that that, that still needs a year or two to play itself out. Well, we've had uh, folks on the on the podcast who've said similar things. Like Mike Mike Demaray from Rainbow was on two episodes ago, and he talked a lot about that about how Rainbow's focus since 
day one was basically on making it accessible and easy for people to use wallets and combining that with with crypto. That's why they only developed for mobile at first and didn't even bother with desktop because they were like, we want people who are used to using the Chase Bank app to use a crypto wallet, not necessarily people who are already crypto native or what have you. Yeah, yeah. And crypto wallets have evolved so much. I mean, everyone's like, oh, like crypto, like, you know, we haven't seen a successful crypto app yet. And it's like 20... 13, 2014, all the way through, you know, the beginning of 2017, it was just a desktop app, the Mist wallet. Um, and it was uh, it just like copy and paste in contract uh, ABIs. Um, like there was no UI at all for a lot of these things. The UI at most was send ETH here. And that was the whole UI. Um, then MetaMask comes in. Um, and then um, pretty quickly afterwards, mobile wallets come in. Um, and it's like, we've we it's it's kind of like looking at um looking at the iPhone and saying you know early into the iPhone oh well there's no you know killer use cases it's just like soundboards um uh and uh you know like goofy accelerometer like drinking this is a beer just this is apps. just a, a what is it this is just a glorified iPod is what people have said yeah exactly yeah. exactly not realizing the changes that would come from these first principles Han Ventures um friend of mine there they they had this great thesis that they that they um published recently called like the 99 cent app era of crypto um where basically we're still in the stage of like individual builders like the early iphone where it's like individual builders doing small experiments and like we're not at the point yet where there's the ubers where there's the airbnbs where there's the door dashes where there's things that are uniquely enabled by mobile capabilities um but we will get there um and i I see crypto in that moment right now, like nouns is an example, a wonderful example of like a few people can make a big impact. Um, you don't need massive teams. You don't need massive amounts of funding. Um, a few people with a great idea can take something forward and it can become larger than itself. Um, at the same time, like crypto has not reached the scale of, you know, everyday mass adoption yet. Um, but that's just like the early iPhone. Like we're not in um, the Uber era yet. We're still in the soundboard and uh, soundboard and accelerometer games, and that's okay. We'll get there. You can even say that about the internet in general, too. You know, there was the early internet is just you're reading things, right? You're, there's. It reminds me of Read Write Own by Chris Dixon talking about that sort of evolution where you know it was really just read only. And then you got to the point of write where, so now you started to have more interactivity and more application of that. And it's, I think it's, it seems like the same kind of thing. We just need, you know, we're, we're getting there, right. We're just not quite there yet, but we'll get there. Yeah. Well, I mean, we know about that too. Cause I mean, we're doing things like, like this podcast, for example, which, you know, will be released as, as an NFT and distributed that way primarily, although we'll still use, you know, Web2 distribution as well. Um, but we're, we're very early on that front. Like every, every single time we upload a podcast, I'm pretty much, you know, in a chat with Joe from Zora for a couple hours trying to make it work just because it's so hard to use still like big videos with IPFS. And so you, there's just these times when you're trying to do anything kind of at the at the cusp of what's possible, it's, uh, you know, it takes a lot of frustration and probably in, in five years, we'll look back and be like, well, yeah, of course, of course the podcast is on chain, you know, how else would people right. get it or whatever. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I was interesting hearing you talk about, um, that period of time where 2018 was your favorite period of time. It's kind of reminding me of last year where a lot of people right after FTX disappeared and they left the space completely. And then what was left were the builders who were really building and staying in it. And I feel like now we're seeing sort of the benefits of that, of those who did stay and who did continue to build, starting to see some of that pay off. And it's, uh, it's exciting. So I can definitely understand that thinking of like, ooh, that was a really good time because it was quieter. And it's really I miss nice it. in the Not, quiet. I, I get yeah. hate for that, but I kind of miss yeah. you know, this recent bear market because it was the bulls fun and everything. But like the bear, you just knew who you were working with. You knew what they were, yeah. why they were here. Uh, when Chris Carella was on this pod, he said the exact same thing. He said he actually left crypto during the last bull market because it was just too much and it was too overwhelming. He, he didn't know who who was real. And then he ended up, what drew him back was the you know, the bear market and being like, okay, now I know, you know, right. people who are here now in my, in my circle, they're here for the right reasons. 
the quote unquote right reasons and being, you know, more likely to be aligned with them. So I, I agree with that. Did you find that, Will? Did you find that this past bear market was similar to 2018? Probably your first bear market will always be, you know, will always loom large, but did you find it similar? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think that um, the difference between 2018 and 2022 as bear markets is that 2018, um, no one had, uh, there wasn't, there was barely any significant venture funding ecosystem. Um, and also people had seen their net worths drop by 90%. Um, uh, and stay flat. Crypto stayed flat for multiple years as tech stocks and everything else kept going up. Um, uh, and uh, I mean, you look at like 2018 and like the depths of the 2020 um, crash, and like you know, you, you could have been totally flat for those for those years. Um, and um, and it was something where uh, it was a lot of solo builders, and many people were sustaining themselves on grants or they'd get like weird jobs um, that's like just hang out here and do R&D here and that's how they stayed in crypto. Um, 2022 was different in that there was a lot of funding that had been deployed in 2021 into companies. So there were a lot of jobs available, um, just not many people who wanted to fill them um, because you know working in crypto was not a super appealing um, proposition. Um, still not, uh, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's still, it still is polarizing, which is a good thing. It's still a filter um, and it will still be a filter for, for some time. Um, but um, yeah, I'd say that uh, in 2022, like I had this interesting experience where ETH Denver 2022 versus ETH Denver 2023, ETH Denver 2022, it felt like everyone was talking about the future of infrastructure and nothing was ready. And then 2023, everyone was talking about infrastructure and it was already, it had all been built over the last year. It was incredible to see. Um, you know, uh, super low fees, layer threes, like DA layers, like Celestia, like uh, embedded wallets, um, uh, decent on ramps and off ramps, like all of it, all of it was 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 ready. Like I, I was even um, talking to some groups about like, you know, like basically like um, the syndicate went from uh, an app to infrastructure. All the protocols remain the same. It was the question of how we how we made it available. Do we make it available to end users or developers? And I was talking to people about the usability side of the app, and I was like, you know, like eighty percent of our support requests were wallet related. Um, uh, they were related to like, how do I unlock MetaMask? How do I submit a transaction? How do I cancel a transaction? Like, gas just spiked. What do I do? Like that eighty percent is solved pretty much by um, like embedded wallets now. And then another 10% was related to, um, you know, chain details. Like why is my transaction taking so long to process? That's essentially solved by layer twos and layer threes, like base optimism and others. Um, and then, um, you know, you look at, uh, like where things are now, like, it's just, uh, we're not quite, quite at the mainstream point on ramping and off ramping is still the big barrier to mainstream crypto adoption. Um, but uh, even like fully gas subsidized models, I'm pretty excited about like, you don't need to unwrap and off ramp if, you know, everyone's playing around with on-chain NFTs and, you know, it's all gas subsidized and every, like, you don't need to, you don't need to unwrap to use the chain anymore. You might need to unwrap to buy things, but you don't need to unwrap. I think that chain. kind of abstraction is, is huge for adoption. Um, you know, yeah. both abstracting gas costs away and also doing things like abstracting bridging all away mm -hmm. like uh, Rain rainbow's been doing that really well like they call they, they basically call bridging swapping in their app so for new people it's kind of like oh you're just swapping from you know ethereum to base ethereum and it feels less you know harrowing maybe for them so that kind of ab abstraction i'm i'm pretty excited about uh, i did want to rewind just a a second though you, you're talking about syndicate and somehow we've gone you know 30 minutes without talking about syndicate at all because <laughs> you got some, such an interesting story but i would love to just pause for a second and, and can you tell us and tell our listeners what is syndicate i know um you know the description that syndicate gives is that it's a, a decentralized investing protocol and a social network but what is syndicate for the uninformed or someone who's never heard of syndicate what do you do yeah so we started syndicate um so we came up with the idea for syndicate in 2018 in the depths of the bear market we were like on-chain communities and on-chain experiences, they will be big. We know that they'll be big. But, um, you know, we had both been in crypto for a while where it was supposedly like just around the corner for like the past five years. Um, and we were like, we know it's not ready yet. We were like, my co-founder Ian and I at IDEO, we were like, let's wait 
let's brainstorm, let's see where things go, let's watch the market. Like, let's watch the market and we see when this starts to be ready. Um, because um, on-chain communities and on-chain experiences are inevitably the future, but not yet. So in 2021, uh, late in DeFi summer, and then into early 2021, we were like, okay, this is, um, this is viable. Like there's enough capital on chain, enough usage on chain that we can start to make these on-chain communities visions real. Um, and um, we were like, we need a first use case for on-chain communities. So um, let's start with investment DAOs. So we built out investment DAO tooling um, for um, most of 2021 um, and uh, most of um, 2022. Um, and uh, yeah, it was um, essentially a, um, a, a, uh, a uh, platform where people could um, could could make investments very easily, but um, we knew that the protocol would be focused on broader on-chain communities. So we had actually designed the protocol to generalize. Any investment clubs that we would recognize? That... Yeah, so um, there were a, there were the a bunch of them were like special purpose vehicles for different angel investment rounds. Um, one VC fund, um, Outlier Ventures, who we know well, they like moved a lot of their fund on chain um uh we couldn't publicly market them due to um sec regulations um so like we were limited in how much they could uh they could grow um but the protocols under the hood were powering a bunch of on-chain community um use cases and there were you know a ton of investment out set up and we we were like and we kept getting approached by people um decrypt slash org radio um fwb um, others who were like, hey, I want to use, um, you know, Syndicate for a community that's not an investment DAO, um, but like also an on-chain community. And we're like, oh, like we thought of that. Like our protocol works for that. Like we can use everything we built off the shelf. Like that's so cool. Um, <laughs> We've been how, waiting how for you. For a community like, <laughs> how does it work for a community like FWB that is decidedly not an investment DAO, but more very yeah. much an on-chain community? So the, the, the short explanation, um, we like power like the V2 of FWB's membership NFT, um, for example, um, and we, we, we used our transaction cloud to help them with, with, with some of the airdrop um, of that V2. Um, and the short um, version of it is that you um, essentially like when building an on-chain community, you don't know everything up front. Um, that's very familiar to nouns, which has had you know, many different um, iterations as as it's gone through its lifespan. Um, and uh, the problem is that most protocols for on-chain communities are built assuming that you know everything up front. The vast majority of them um, are immutable. They can't be changed. Um, Nouns is uniquely thoughtful in that it can be changed, um, but most are not. And uh, we basically built out a protocol called um, ERC-721M and ERC-20M. Um, with M stands for modular, where you can swap out these different modules of logic around how mint should be handled, burn should be handled, transfer should be handled. So you can say, oh, for example, you could say this mint um, should start out being token gated um, and then change the token gating over time. Then you can swap out and say, actually this mint um, should be referral based. Um, or you could say like this mint um, should be a public sale. This mint should be an open mint. Um, with most NFTs, um, you can't change that. So you need to completely redeploy the NFT. Um, with 721M and 20M, it was structured so that you could. Um, so a bunch of groups came to us being like, we need more, we need a bunch of flexibility. Um, we need something more customizable. And we we're like, great, we have that. So we started offering that. Um, and then, um, groups kept approaching us for more and more features along those lines. They were like, I want an easy way to broadcast transactions on chain, whether that's like airdrops or payment, um, flows or, um, or, or like on-chain games and on-chain social. And we we're like, great. Like we can build out a transaction cloud for you. So we built out a backend to do a bunch of transactions. And then um, we also um, uh, built out um, a, uh, we started building out layer threes um, uh, out of the Farcaster Frames ecosystem. We launched a syndicate frame chain, which we just saw because we we're like, gas fees need to be lower to do incredible things on chain. Um, we really need a layer three. So we didn't see one. So we we're like, let's go build one. Um, and then we helped DGen launch their layer three and a few others. So it's kind of all come together in the suite of um, infrastructure products that lets you build out excellent crypto experiences without needing to worry about gas, without needing to worry about, um, you know, like a lot of crypto specific developer tooling. You can just build the app, 
that's an excellent app and then um like integrate it into your game or social application where you don't need to worry about um anything uh on the like really really finicky crypto specific side we handle all of that well that leads into probably the most important question of this podcast today which is uh on the topic of l3s so everyone wants to know you know what is an l3 you know why are l3s you know everyone's just wrapped their heads a lot of people just wrap their heads around l2s and the whole sort of modular structure of, of the roll up um the, the roll up future for ethereum why why are l3s important why did you you mentioned a couple examples you mentioned that you built uh, the frame chain for for Farcaster frames and then you helped uh dgen launch the dgen l3 can you talk about each of those in turn and, and sort of explain why it's helpful or useful to have an l3 for that those applications um so i'll i'll start with them, some definitions so um what is an l2 an l2 is a chain um that um settles funds and settles data back to a layer one so if you are using optimism you're bridging in and out of Optimi in and out of Ethereum mainnet to optimism. Um, and then um, your data is also being written to um, Ethereum uh, blobs effectively. Um, and then um, a layer three uh, is you uh, take all of that, but you do it on a layer two instead. And you often swap out the data layer um, for lower gas fees as well. Um, so instead of bridging for a degen chain, instead of bridging in and out of Ethereum mainnet, you're bridging in and out of base. And you're bridging in and out of base because um, DGEN's token is already on base, DGEN's users are already on base. So you can start to build a chain that's entirely your own on top of these layer twos, whether it's base or optimism or others, that's completely customizable by you, that's incredibly low fee, talking like a millionth through a billionth of a penny um, in terms of fees. Um, what makes what makes the fees lower? I've had that question asked. I've had that question asked on our daily spaces once. Someone was like, "Well, why are L threes cheaper? Like, wouldn't wouldn't they just inherit the cost savings of of L two? So, what is it about L threes that makes them actually makes the gas costs actually cheaper? Just the walled garden of congestion is that is that why? Um, so it's there's a few different elements that go into it. Um, we're actually working on a post on this that that should break it down pretty nicely. Um, but it's uh, essentially um, so take a layer two, 90% of the gas costs in a layer two transaction um, are writing data to Ethereum mainnet. It's the cost of what people call data availability, um, which is oftentimes people think it's data storage. It's not actually data storage, it's just data publishing um, to ensure that nodes get the data. Um, uh, Ethereum blobs expire, like the 4844 blobs um, uh, have already started expiring. Um, so. It's up to the nodes to store it. RIP. Yeah, yeah. There's a whole evolution of layer twos that I have a lot of thoughts on. Um, but uh, they, they used to not expire. Now they expire. Um, uh, and um, and uh, that that's also why cost on layer twos dropped so much after 4844 came in is because 90% of your costs just dropped by 90%. Cool. <laughs> that's great. That makes it cheaper. Um, uh, but you still have two areas of high costs. Um, one area is the bridging costs. If you're bridging in and out of Ethereum mainnet, that transfer, because Ethereum mainnet is expensive, is going to cost you a few dollars at least. When gas is really expensive, maybe like 10, 20. And for a lot of users who are, um, you know, um, trying out like small dollar amounts, like if you want to mint an NFT for, you know, $5, you don't want to spend $5 bridging to mint that NFT for $5 um, from there. Um, the second, um, that's, that's a problem for abstracting too, right? Because when, right. when you're bridging back and forth between mainnet, you can't really hide that cost. Exactly. You know I mean? Exactly. Like when, when descent.xyz says you can pay with Ethereum on mainnet, it's like, well, you could, <laughs> but it's not going to be anywhere near <laughs> the cost to. of paying with a <laughs> right. base or whatever. Yeah. You'll be much better off paying. Yeah. From a layer two, um, or another chain. Um, yeah, a, a, a low fee chain, like a layer three. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's something where, um, that bridging cost is substantial. Um, people say that instant bridges are a solution here, but um, that uh, misses two things. One is that the instant bridges introduce risk and the liquidity providers for the instant bridges need to be compensated for that risk. So it increases fees um, because you're putting your funds in a bridge and bridges get hacked a lot. Um, uh, the second thing um, that uh, it doesn't solve is that if you have a token that's not ETH for um, 
a uh, layer two or layer three, um, your instant bridge liquidity will be much lower because um, a ton of people hold ETH, fewer people hold, um, you know, individual tokens. So, and then, if, and then you need the subset of that group to then put money into the instant bridge. Um, so bridging costs are also um, high and the data costs, the cost to publish these blobs is still high. So you can reduce with the layer three, you can reduce the bridging cost dramatically by bridging in and out of layer two for, you know, a few cents. Um, and then you can reduce the data cost dramatically by using a modular data availability layer like Celestia or EigenDA. Um, a layer two could do that too, but it's not quite as cheap as a layer three. Um, so what you get is it's really cheap to bridge in and out of the chain and it's really cheap to use the chain. And then you have this totally customizable dedicated block space for anything you want to do. Um, that these kinds of become like community challenge points like DGen chain. There's a ton of people on DGen chain who want to interact with different things in the DGen ecosystem, which is really like in many ways, like a tipping and a giving ecosystem, which is great. It's kind of like what, what, what people wanted crypto to be in terms of like these micropayments and microtransactions and, 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 and having fun on chain. Um, uh, kind so of some of that zeitgeist that Dogecoin captured in early days with the tipping and whatnot. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Very similar to that philosophy. That was his. Um, um, that was his inspiration, by the way. That was yeah. I, I interviewed Yasek last week, and Dogecoin. He's oh, very nice. big with Great. Dogecoin, and that was part of the inspiration for the tipping. Was was the yeah. uh, early early yeah, Doge, Dogecoin uh, applications. Yeah. Yeah, and Dogecoin had that before it gets financial. Right. Before it got financialized, like when people are doing Dogecoin right. tipping in like 2014, 2015, they tip like, oh yeah, here's like thirty thousand Doge. You know, like <laughs> I like your I like your comment on Reddit. Right. Like here's thirty thousand Doge. Right. Um, exactly. Uh, and it was a meme. It wasn't More worth anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then it got financialized, and then people started, um, you know, not tipping thirty thousand Doge anymore. Um, but yeah, that's right. also why Dogecoin's tipping mechanism is pretty elegant. Is that you're tipping out of the new amount of right. DGEN, not out of your own DGEN um, holdings. Exactly. So um, people can be much right. more generous in that way. Is that sustainable long-term? I think I think it is sustainable if it becomes like Ethereum is like a like 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 a medium of exchange. We're using it as a currency. A bunch of things are denominated in DGEN. That's why I'm excited by the DGEN chain is because the DGEN chain is kind of like everyone here is denominated in DGEN. Everyone here is making DGEN stronger. And the more people join the DGEN community, the more we can give um, in this DGEN community, the more that we can have this tipping um, be a mechanism that works in the long term. Because the layer three, like if there's enough DGEN usage, um, DGEN becomes you know desirable as money. Um, you could imagine a scenario where like DGEN has similar dynamics like ETH under 1559. I'm not speaking from any particular point of knowledge there. It's just uh, just you know like some some like 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 one potential Alpha, token design. No. <laughs> no, no. Um, we, 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 uh, I, I have a lot of thoughts on like, uh, like, uh, you know, uh, like different, um, bridging options and smart wallet standards. That's where my alpha is, but, um, <laughs> not, not, there's not a ton for, no, uh, for, 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 for tokens there. Um, uh, yeah. Um, well, the, the bankless, but... the bankless boys talk a, a lot about the moneyness of ETH. And, uh, I think you, you were on their podcast recently, but they talk a lot about the, the moneyness of ETH and, and, that's part of the reason why sometimes new shiny L1s get a premium to other L2s is because of that moneyness factor. And from what you're just saying now, I can sort of see how that some of that moneyness factor can get translated into uh, an asset like DGen without having to be its own L1 in a way. Exactly. And there's a funny argument that people make sometimes, uh, particularly like very, very... Um smart crypto investors who think a lot about game theory. Um, this isn't a particular subtweet of anyone. I've heard this argument in a lot of places, which is that um, the uh, the value of a layer two will never exceed the value of a layer one. And the value of a layer three will never exceed the value of the layer two because value will be captured by the underlying layers. And like, if you know, like, uh, like like a layer two like base or optimism becomes big like that's going to offer a tailwind for ETH because ETH will be seen as having more potential as the home for like the next dozen optimisms the next dozen Ethereum the next dozen bases um, and that argument I've always found it to be like there's there's no fundamental reason why the TVL of a layer three or a layer two can't exceed the layer one like especially since um, it's getting different things from the underlying layer. Um, for ETH mainnet, the layer twos are getting data availability for 
layer threes from the layer two, they're getting um, uh, like a basically a fiat on ramp and off ramp, so to speak. Um, that's why base is a great settlement layer for many of these because it's it's a really good um, fiat on ramp and off ramp for ETH. Like it, those should just be valued differently. Everybody, if everybody coming on chain is coming on to let's just say DGN L three directly from their Coinbase account, then that that theory that you sort of subtweeted but didn't subtweet doesn't doesn't fold up anymore because people didn't have to come into ethereum first and then bridge to base and then bridge to l3 is that kind of what you're getting at yeah yeah and i think i think that like right now we're kind of thinking of these things as like um you know a layer two is like a lesser version of a layer one and a layer three is a lesser version of a layer two but really like it's it's scaling like how compute scales in 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 computing um you almost always scale by just um, scaling horizontally by adding more of something. So it's like, if we want to scale block space, the way we scale block space is by adding more block space. Like, sure, like there's like a visual diagram you can have of like layer one and layer two and layer three. And it's like, oh, the layer one is the most fundamental layer. So therefore it's the most valuable, right? But like, if you look at it from a computing perspective, it's like, hey, we have block space. Block space on Ethereum is very expensive. Block space on layer twos is less expensive. And block space on layer threes um, is even less expensive and even more customizable. And it's like, if, if, if what you're doing with ETH as a currency is paying for block space, um, then, um, you know, like, why, like, why, why should like cheaper block space, um, not accrue more value? Like it's, 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 it's like, uh, in many cases, if you cut prices, you increase usage beyond the amount that you're, that, that, that is being taken up in the price cuts. Like now, like one cent, uh, transactions versus like millionth of a penny transactions. Yeah, sure. Those are different levels of price cuts. You need a lot of usage to make up for that. But if these are markets or block space, um, it's it's it seems obvious to me that the cheaper markets for block space that can provide it more affordability will uh, end up with accruing more value than the more expensive block space, the boutique block space. Like there's a role for that boutique block space. Like I think Nouns votes should be on layer one for the foreseeable future. Um, but uh, but like you're not going to you know like pay for your DoorDash order on a layer one. You're not going to. You might not even pay for it on a layer two. Why would you? If it's one or two cents for transactions, you know, multiply that across millions of transactions. Um, when you can with the DoorDash L three, like get that um for free. And, yeah, we did an educational video about the super chain, and and uh, my prompt to Jack, our, our YouTube guy, was to create a video about bridging that didn't use the word bridge once. And <laughs> nice. the way we ended up doing it was, it was essentially very similar to what you were just talking about and, and talking about like checking versus savings account. It's like, you're not going to go, right. you're not going to go to McDonald's and use your locked, you know, savings, long-term high interest savings account to buy a hamburger. You know, that's kind of like your ETH main, main net, but then you will go and use your, your base ETH, you know, to buy a hamburger because that's kind of like your, your checking yeah. account. It's not a perfect analogy, but it helps people to sort of visualize why they need different, you know, layers to their, you know, to their, their crypto portfolio. Quick, just a quick point on Superchain. One interesting thing about the Superchain is that it's commonly interpreted as a bridging standard, but it's actually not. It's actually a messaging standard. It's how these layer, it's how these OP stack chains communicate. And when you view it as a messaging standard, it becomes obvious that what layer these messages are um, it, 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 it doesn't make a massive difference. Like, yes, you have some different security assumptions. You have different assumptions of like, okay, if there's a fraud proof submitted to the layer two, then that reorgs the layer three. Sure. Like there's some security assumptions embedded in there, but like if you're sending messages from one chain to another, it's not like you're sending them in layers. You're just sending them across chains. Um, and bridging is the same way. Like if you have native messaging, you could have native bridging between these chains and suddenly like. You can bridge from layer three to layer three natively. And like all these layer distinctions just, I think will fall away. Just like no one on the internet um, who's using it thinks about like which part of the networking stack they're using. Like no one logs on and they're like, oh yes, like my personal computer is connected to my router and this goes to my cable provider and this goes to the internet backbone. And like, no one's thinking about the layers. They're just like, I like, you know, send this message to this person. Yeah. Yeah. You're, you don't think and about similarly, those hops. And similarly, they yeah. only care if it works and if it's cheap. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Does it work? Yeah. And how much does it cost me? Yeah, exactly. I was thinking about Coming when you're talking about the value of the different um, layers. 
uh, right <laughs> now, and this happened in the past few months, I have most of my value, my ETH is sitting in base way more nice than mainnet now. And I don't see that changing in the near future. I, I and I also have, um, you know, quite a significant portion on DGen chain right now. So it's interesting to see how quickly that happened from, you know, just August to now. And there's been a massive shift for me. And I know a lot of people are similar that they have a lot more base ETH than they have mainnet ETH now. So it's and yeah. I don't also see protocols, that changing anytime soon. There's also yeah. protocols like Renzo too, which are doing really interesting things, allowing people to essentially, you know, interact on mainnet without having to actually move their ETH back there, right? Mm. You can you can essentially stake with Renzo and they, mm. they'll stake your ETH for you on mainnet. And so it's fewer reasons why people need to bridge their ETH back right. as well, just to add on. Yeah. And I think that's the perfect thing that this argument about like, you know, a layer on top will never capture more value than the underlying layer will never be more valuable than the underlying layer misses is like, um, you know, like fine, like security is one thing and like Ethereum mainnet is the most secure layer. Yeah, it is. Um, but uh, usage is another and like if all your usage is somewhere else, you're going to move your assets there. You're not going to think to yourself like, okay, like do I want to be, you know, on Ethereum mainnet with its widely distributed set of nodes or do I want to be on a layer two, which for the most part are effectively centralized right now. Um, uh, like you're not gonna think in those terms. It'll just be like, oh, I'm using my ETH here, so I'll put my ETH here, and that's it. And uh, that's and that's making like, ETH. That's that's the other thing too. Like the reason why Prof right. probably has so much ETH on base is because right. she's probably making ETH on base in the, in the <laughs> right. bull market. I didn't, I didn't bridge that amount of ETH to base. No, right. Yeah, exactly. yeah, no. yeah. But uh, but but yeah. I have, but that I'm, starts yeah, to exactly, happen exactly. with the with an economy, right? That starts to happen with an economy that when you start to receive it more in that denomination, then that becomes more valuable to you. You're going to look to spend it in that denomination. So it's, you know, it's yeah, just that's a, great it's framing a natural too. flow. Yeah. Right. Like you have, you have imports and exports of these chains effectively. Ethereum is exporting security. Basically that's what they're doing. They're exporting security to layer twos and they're importing, um, you know, like funds that want to stake, they're importing funds that want to interact in this very fundamental layer. Base has a very different import and export. It's it's like import and export is, um, you know, this like crypto culture, like optimism, it's this import and export of public goods, like arbitrage, it's this like import and export of like um, gaming and many other applications related to it. And it's like, there's there like, like there's, there's a, there, like when, when you're talking about the chains that are importing and exporting, like what, countries those flow through in terms of the layers becomes irrelevant at a certain point like as long as those underlying layers won't censor you or won't tax you or can't block you um it's like if you have guaranteed free trade so to speak um between layers like they can import and export freely anything they would like and like dgen's import is you know dgen token from the dgen community and their export is really fun things to do on chain and like more experimental, like more cutting edge. And I, these chains, that's what they are. They're independent, sovereign, effectively block space um, that can choose how they want to govern themselves. Um, to think that there's some kind of hierarchy and value capture um, seems absurd when free trade between these sovereign layers is, is, is effectively guaranteed. I like that framing. And that kind of leads into a question that I had about L3s as well with regards to sort of their composability and like, I guess, the the modular thesis really coming to bear in, in L3s. A good example would be the DGen L3, where I, I believe DA is, is done via Arbitrum 1. Is that right? Or it's Arbitrum, Arbitrum Mini Trust. Yeah. So h how does how does that work for people who are sort of wondering about that, how that free trade works in practice? Because if I understand correctly, DGen L3 is built on the base L2, on top of the base, base L2, but it also interacts with uh, with Arbitrum chain L2 for its, its data availability. Uh, so it uses the Arbitrum Orbit stack, um, but the data okay. availability is, 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 is any trust, which, which is not tied directly okay. to Arbitrum itself. Um, uh, but... Um, so what does, where does Orbit come in in that equation? Uh, yeah, so Orbit is the role of framework. So I guess to use um, an analogy, um, like the role of framework is the operating system and data availability is the internet provider. Um, and the settlement layer is, um, I mean, it's kind of like your, your, your 
banking your payment layer for the internet. It's like your PayPal or whatever else. Um, uh, so um, yeah, it's in this case, it's using Arbitrum's rollup stack, but um, uh, settling um, to base, which is very interesting because it like kind of cuts across the super chain and the Arbitrum orbit um, space. Um, that wasn't an intentional design decision. We just needed custom gas tokens and Arbitrum. I was going to say, um, is that why? Yeah. Available. Yeah. So um, uh, that's that was that was a key key factor in the reasoning. But they also have very different philosophies, which is fascinating. I I I, I am big fans of both teams. I know both teams well. Um, and OP stack is interesting because Optimism's OP stack is built for interoperability. It's built around the super chain thesis. It's built around um, interoperable messages between chains, which yes, also includes funds because bridges are essentially messages about which funds have been deposited where and should be withdrawn where. Um, but um, but it's very focused on 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 like yeah, this like interoperable layer where like the sum is greater than the parts. Arbitrum Orbit is very focused on customizability. It's like we want every single component to be customizable. You can customize it as you wish and like if it settles to Arbitrum, then it's free to use. And if it doesn't settle to Arbitrum, then there's a 10% um, uh, fee in terms of uh, in terms of uh, sequence of revenue to use it. And it's two very different philosophies, which is nice because I'm glad that like you have a philosophy that's pushing for this interoperability and a philosophy that's pushing for this customizability. Um, having them uh, having them having them uh, operate together is 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 very nice. And don't get me wrong, like. I'm, I'm, I'm sure like you, you can, uh, you can make OP stack customizable. You can make Arbitrum Orbit, um, interoperable, but like, like the philosophies that they come at this with are very different. And it's, uh, it's almost like, will like the maximum like creativity win will it be all these really weird customizations or will it be like this maximum, like internetworking of these chains? Will that win? Um, like it is it, it is the import and export analogy, but more like is it like a trading block that will win or is it like all the like crazy governance and regulatory experiments that like lead to like, you know, special economic zones for all sorts of things. Or, or is it both? We'll Cause see. I mean, you just demonstrated that sometimes you can take like what you like from both, you know, from both yeah. baskets and, and, and make a Frankenstein. You could, you yeah. could. Why not both? A few steps in doing so, but yes, you can. <laughs> yeah. Just, just come to syndicate. They'll do it for you. We'll do, it <laughs> we'll do it with you. That's, that's your plug. There with, you yeah. yeah, so it's really interesting to hear about how you started to dive into the L3s. It really seemed tied to Farcaster. So what is it about Farcaster that helped to push that innovation forward? And, you know, just in general, why, why is Syndicate diving into sort of that ecosystem? Yeah, yeah. So... Um, I, I, I joined Farcaster rather early. I have FID one five, five, um, username Ooh. at will. Um, that's a flex. flex. Uh, that's a big old flex, <laughs> which, <laughs> which, which, uh, which, which, which stood out to me because I was like, I built up, you know, somewhat of a, you know, presence on Twitter. I don't try to build any sort of presence. I just, I actually have a simple rule, which is, um, if I, um, say something twice, um, uh, then I should probably tweet it. Um, and that's just how I think about Twitter. Um, uh, because if it generalized, it's probably interesting. That's it. So I don't like have like any, you know, particular approach to it, but I joined Farcaster and I was like, oh, this is like a really, really interesting and potential feature. Um, and like, there's tons of cool builders. Um, uh, a lot of the discussion at the time very early was centered on essentially like talking about, um, you know, talking about Farcaster on Farcaster, which like was really cool if we were building on Farcaster, but we weren't building on Farcaster at the time. So I was like, this is cool. Like I'll keep tracking it. But like, I wasn't, I wasn't particularly active. Um, and then um, uh, frames happened and I was like, wow, like this is like, now there's tons and tons of really cool things that I can build on Farcaster. Like I don't have to build a client. I can just build like a web page and a simple backend and like a bunch of our tooling at Syndicate is already useful for this. Like, cool. I can like throw something together in like a day. So I did for frames. I threw together, threw together like an on-chain cow, like cow clicker, like Farmville style game. And from there, like Farcaster, I'd say is like I think I missed that one. Far, I think I like, missed the cow clicker. Now I want to go find it. I'll have to go find it now. Yeah, it's <laughs> it's very deep, but it's there. Um, uh, and then we uh, and like that frames frames Friday was just incredible. Like that whole weekend was amazing. Um, the next weekend, there's hackathon in San Francisco that I went to, and the the energy. Energy was just fantastic where it's like, wow, 
Like suddenly, like with frames, Farcaster greatly expanded the number of builders you can build on Farcaster because now you don't have to build a client. You can build like some metadata and that's it. And you're good to go. Um, so it's just been an incredible community for that. The builders there are, are so talented. I'd say like Twitter is mostly traders at this point and Farcaster is mostly builders. Um, so yeah, I, I, I love the ecosystem. I think it like took some time to ramp up because like it needed to appeal to like broader, broader and broader groups of builders. Like myself, it took like some time for it to resonate with me. Um, but then, you know, as they've kept expanding, who can build on Farcaster? Um, I've yeah, kept, kept, kept growing more and more interested in it. I want to ask about DGen chain too, in relation to that. Um, when I talked to Yasek last week and interviewed him, he mentioned that you actually went to him and suggested this L3 for DGen chain and it, he like, he <laughs> needed to think about it a little yeah, bit. Yeah. So how, well, how did that pop in your head of like, you know, what would be great for an L3 is DGen? Um, like how did that all kind of come about and, uh, and now you're doing uh, deploy on DGen week. And I'd love to know like what you're seeing getting built there and give us some alpha if you have any. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so, uh, essentially, um, uh, with the DGEN L3, um, we had launched the syndicate frame chain for the Farcaster frames. We had worked with a group, um, called gold, which is building like a Farmville style game. Um, and, uh, and, and, and we were talking with DGEN and with DGEN, it was like, they have such an engaged community. This is an amazing, amazing, uh, amazing place. Um, like, like, how do we, how do we really push the boundaries of what's possible? Um, and a layer three um, with ultra low gas fees and a ton of customizability um, really seemed like something that could start to differentiate DGen because the more DGen could evolve in like a DGen specific DGen customizable way, the better. Like we started out talking about like what if we do on chain signature verification of Farcaster data? Like, what if we start mirroring Farcaster data? Like, what if we start doing like all these things that make DGen like a really useful chain for the Farcaster ecosystem with a unique set of um, capabilities that you wouldn't find on another chain? Um, and Yasek, um, I, I, I'm, I'm very, I'm very um, grateful for, 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 for the, the, the kind words. He is really like a, 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 a like, like, like the, 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 the total like amazing brainstorming person on this. He like has so many great ideas about where DGen chain should be used, like has been an amazing partner on this. Um, and like our first call, like it was just like myself, Ian and Yasek were on a call. It was during East Denver, the Wi-Fi that Ian and I had in our hotel was like really choppy and not that great. And the, even so the ideas are just flying like a million miles a minute. We're like, yeah, we could do this and we could do this and we could do this. And like, um, uh, yeah, he's, he's, he's been an incredible person to work with where we can start to get this kind of ecosystem that's, that's different than what exists. Um, and it'll evolve over time. Like it's not something that, um, that, uh, that will happen overnight. Like we need to see what usage patterns emerge to know what to target, but, um, it, it will get there in a really exciting way. And, uh, that's where deploy on DGen week, which has, um, a couple hundred builders who are participating in it, um, who all want to deploy to DGen. It's, it's, um, it's it's fantastic to see because um, the more we get a sense of what people are building on DGen chain, um, which is very bottom up, very organic. It's like it's very nouns nouns aligned in its in its way of like yeah, like anyone can build anything, and like building in this ecosystem gives you like a great amount of attention from people who care about this ecosystem. Different different people in the ecosystems, different goals, but um, but but I'd say like similar bottom up experimental creative ethos. And like the more we see that, um, the more we'll be able to you know, say like, oh, this thing that you're doing on chain, we can make this 10 times easier by customizing the chain. Or we can, oh, like you need data from this place. Like we can start to mirror data there. Um, that I think is, uh, is, is where things will, will end up going. Um, and uh, yeah, like the more builders deploy to DGen, the more we can, yeah, make sure that DGen chain um, is customized for them and has this unique, like, you know, experiments and what it can do with its block space compared to others. You mentioned nouns just now, and you mentioned uh, nouns a couple of times earlier as well. Obviously, this is a nounish podcast. We like to look at things from sort of the perspective of the nouniverse. I'd love to hear a little bit about your take on nouns. How did you first come to nouns, and, and what sort of attracted you to this community? Yeah, yeah. So I got excited about nouns since Rinkby. I saw it. Uh, I saw its test transactions, and I was like, 
this is cool for two reasons. One is like, I love on chain art, like on chain art is my favorite area of art. Um, and nouns is on chain in a really innovative way. And the way that these traits are governable is fascinating. Um, so that was really cool. And then the second um, thing about it was like, oh, it's a DAO that has revenue. That's nice in a world that, that, that where DAO most DAOs don't have revenue. And also on top of that, like the revenue is an ETH. Um, a lot of DAOs have revenue only in their native token if they have revenue at all. So then they don't want to spend their native token because like at the points when they should be spending more to attract more people and like sentiment is low, they're actually spending less because their token values are done. Um, it's very counterproductive. Um, uh, so I was like, wow, this is really cool. We have a DAO with fascinating on-chain art with ETH-based ETH revenue. I was like, when it hits mainnet, like, yeah, like I'm early to this and I'll be able to bid. And then the first now goes like 600 ETH and I'm like, oh. <laughs> yeah, okay. not so much. Um, I'm yeah, early, I'll be able to not. get something real. I'll get in here really cheap, no problem. <laughs> okay, no. Exactly. Shout out, shout out Zykes. <laughs> shout out yeah. At yeah. least your Rinkby, uh, your Rinkby nouns were, were not too bad, I'm sure. <laughs> Rigby's gone. Um, so I know. sadly, Gosh. sadly, I have, I have, uh, I have no, no, uh, no, no, That's true. no, uh, yeah, no, 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 we yeah, I don't, I don't know where the rink B data is. That's an interesting question. We should figure that out. Um, uh, I have a lot of great memories on a rink B. Um, but um, yeah, uh, then um, nouns, it was interesting seeing like its evolution from afar um, uh, of like, oh, like there's this cool, like, you know, like, like proliferate the meme angle. Oh, there's this public goods angle. Oh, it's interesting. And like seeing that develop and that identity develop. And then I was at a dinner in San Francisco um, and I randomly sit next to Hong, noun 40, and we just like chat about nouns for like two hours straight. Like we're so excited about it. And at the end, he's like, um, he's like, hey, Will, like I, I I have like a noun that I want to delegate. Like, would you like to be the delegate of noun one, two, three? And I'm like, I'd be honored. Like, I'd love to participate. So then I started voting in nouns. Um, and that was, you know, fun to like be able to start to share my point of view. I have like technical expertise that is, you know, valuable to the DAO. Um, some, some, thoughts on, you know, where things are going, like chains and bridges and stuff. Um, uh, um, and then, um, uh, yeah, I, I, I became a nouns gardener. Um, uh, so I was like curating some of the um, prep house uh, open rounds. And then um, uh, I also like helped bring in some groups like Glitch is like a community of artists that I know. And I was like, you should apply for a grant with nouns. Like they're an amazing group. Like you're an amazing group. And like, they just ran a prep house round where like, five excellent proposals are funded um, uh, from like everything from like um, mechanical plants that can like talk um, to like, uh, like, like performance art um, to like, um, like, like on-chain art. It's really, really fascinating seeing what emerged from it. And I'd say now my, my nouns contributions, I view it as like, um, I, 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 uh, I want to share my voice, like where I think I have a unique point of view. Um, so like, I spend a lot of time on governance on the things that I think um, I have, you know, a unique perspective. Like I am very strongly against nouns moving governance to a layer two for now, um, especially if they don't move auctions to layer two, um, because I've done a lot related to chains and it's like, you can go all in on the chain, but don't, don't, don't try to go cross chain. Like <laughs> it'll make your life a lot harder. Um, That's an interesting point. That's an interesting point. What would you suggest as a, as a different remediation for, the pain point that's causing people to talk about that, the fact that it's very expensive to govern. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's um, a few, a few, a few different options. Um, like one is like basically make like um, participation in this sort of governance opt-ins. So, like you already have Nounsel and little nouns um, if they still have nouns. Um, uh, but you already have like those groups that are, um, you know, basically like running their internal votes and then they're voting um, uh, externally with their nouns. You could imagine like a thing where like you're voting on a layer two, then there's like a real layer that um, votes on layer one. And then, um, you know, it can like bundle the votes, bundle the votes together um, in a more compelling way um, where uh, you could imagine, yeah, structures where like, um, uh, yeah, yeah. I think that, I think that like, basically like if you aggregate the voting, um, on a layer two and then you write it all on the layer one in one bundle like it'll make your life easier um that uh that that um like i think like every individual vote going on chain on its own is the most expensive option um 
But, uh, you know, if people can voluntarily opt in or opt out of some of these security assumptions, I think that's better than all of Noun's trying to move, um, especially since for now you do have lower liquidity on layer twos and layer threes. Um, so maybe maybe it's more something like Noun's camp or some someone that could tackle this is what you're sort of saying, that your votes on some of these platforms could become like essentially off chain, off, off chain and then combined together exactly like you escrow them in some kind of relayer that relayer has certain guarantees exactly and if like you disagree with the relayer or like the relayer starts um acting like it's it's hard to fake that those things in a well-designed relayer but it's you can not deny you can censor even if you can't manipulate which is its own form of manipulation because you could censor like no votes and not yes votes like people as long as they could move between relayers quite quickly like that would work well um so like you you would I, I in my mind like instead of trying to move nouns to a layer two, just let individual voters move to a layer two, um, and then let the votes be aggregated on layer one. Um, right. I think that like something like that. That's that's where I tend to express most of my governance opinions. I'd say like at this point I am, I I I uh, I, I spend the most time on things where I have a unique point of view, particular experience, or a view where I disagree with the DAO on it. Um, if everything's kind of like all voting the same way with like hundred percent yes or near to it like you know like 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 i i i i sometimes spend less time there versus like just spending my time on on the questions that are most i think a lot of people a lot of people are sort of that's fair uh, acting that way recently yeah 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 and like i like it's healthy for the DAO to have more participation of course um but um uh i think like in my mind like participation is the vote and participation is the vote with reason and like my vote with reason matters more than my than my vote um so i i spend a lot of time on the ones where i can you know craft it um well appreciate those oh, very well crafted votes with reason i do i read them they're, very, they're always really good well what are you most optimistic about for the future of nouns so i think um nouns has uh done a really really good job in bringing in um participation and governance i think it's done quite a good job at bringing in enough revenue that it's sustainable um and broad strokes um uh of course people have different definitions of what sustainable is like how much we should be spending but like broadly speaking like eth is continuing to come into the dow um uh which which is good um i think where i'm most optimistic is um about attracting all of these builders um to nouns who might not have thought of nouns before um so the farcaster nouns um collaboration was an excellent example where a bunch of people came in and were participating who might not have thought to turn to nouns for funding i love the glitch prop house for the same reason it was a artist who hadn't had exposure to nouns who are now um starting to use prop house and starting to understand how nouns can 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 fund their work, um, and I think um, as 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 nouns continues to grow, I think that that's the most important thing we can do is um, bring in a broad group of people who are funded by nouns, who have this positive perception of nouns, this positive perception of crypto, um, and uh, small amounts can go a long way. I would personally like to see fewer, like five hundred k, like for like you know like x like you know sponsorship or event and like more like you know 50k 100k for like these grants um these gatherings like i think like like i would like to see yes like smaller um smaller with like a greater uh greater range of um beneficiaries versus you know large like nouns should be you know the primary anchor of xyz i don't i haven't really expressed that much in my votes yet um because i think i need to develop my own thesis around it more um but uh but i would like to see nouns make lots of lots of small bets i've come to a, a similar conclusion also with regards to like smaller groups of smaller sub DAOs or organizations like what we're doing with the yellow collective and just seeing how much impact you can have by just branching out into other ecosystems as well because uh, i think one of the strongest things about the yellow collective is that it's not just all the same characters you know like it, that's one thing we worried about when we launched is like is it just going to be you know, a bunch of nouns, people just wearing a different costume, you know, wearing a different color of, of noggles, but it hasn't turned out to be that way. You know, we've, we've attracted a lot of new interested people in nouns from the base ecosystem and from Farcaster. And that's made me super bullish on, you know, people addressing their individual niches. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think, um, uh, it's, um, 
I I I I I I think that um, nouns for a specific ecosystem um, via Yellow Collective and like some of the nouns builder DAOs like Purple um, uh, tend to work very well. I think um, the thing that I'll be interested to see where they emerge is like nouns at the end of the day is a model that requires sustained attention um, uh, because you do need attention on it every day. You do have the daily auction model. Um, I think that that probably limits the, how niche your ecosystem can go. Like base is a pretty good size. Like Farcaster is a pretty good size as an ecosystem for sustaining that daily attention. But like you couldn't really pull it off. Like the glitch community that I worked with on the on 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 uh, on helping them set up the prop house and such, um, and their and their grants program. Um, that like you know is like like. Um, like you know some incredibly incredibly talented artists but it's like 100 to 200 people depending on um you know how how broad a brush you draw um like you couldn't run a daily auction model on that so i think like how does nouns um spread to smaller communities that can't sustain daily attention i think that is more so grants and less so their own sub DAOs. but i do think there's like like ideally like the sub DAOs can then get even more niche like you know like like purple can start to fund things um, on Farcaster that might be like smaller grants or less attention than nouns would normally give to something. But then like nouns can say, great, I'm going to like nouns, nouns should likely commit to ecosystems. Like we're going to fund the Farcaster ecosystem. We're going to fund experiments here. Um, and then I think the sub DAOs should commit to projects. And I think that that's likely a good way to go. Um, but yeah, I think that, um, we're not, we're not, uh, not, 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 I think like nouns is, 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 is still like split between like, should it fund projects in a substantial way or should it fund ecosystems besides the nouns tooling, which is really funding like a nouns ecosystem of, of tooling. It's more like, yeah, like, I think like nouns ecosystem, forecaster ecosystem, it's done well, but, um, yeah, it should, it should be able to expand to more of the ecosystem level. Your point about the sustaining uh, attention uh, required by a daily auction is really, really well taken because even with yellow, even though we have like a pretty large audience with, with the base ecosystem and the Farcaster ecosystem, you know, there's days where I forget to cast the daily auction and, and, and the auction goes for like one third of the, of the 20 day moving average. Just because I should set up a to bot cast. to tell me when you haven't cast it. That'll be great. <laughs> Shoot. I gave you alpha. I gave you alpha. I, I mean, mean it's I, only I happened. Who knows what to look for. <laughs> <laughs> it's only happened once, but it, the, the point is, going is camping like, or like out of, okay. out of internet. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> we'll do. But that just goes to show you that it, you know, in the early days, especially yeah. it does take a lot to keep that attention up. Even if you're, even if you're getting a lot of it already. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. And I think like nouns should experiment more with funding models, but I think like over time, like there's enough ecosystems large enough to sustain it. That's not a burning problem for the DAO at this point. Awesome. Well, I, I know we've gone a little bit over time because it's been so much fun chatting with you, but one thing I did want to ask you, and maybe we could sort of cap off with this. I wanted to ask what you are most excited about for this, for this, this cycle. I know we're kind of in the swing of it right now, but what, what's really getting you going the most right now? And what are you most excited about? Yeah, I think this is, this is where consumer crypto finally becomes mainstream. Um, maybe I'm making this prediction five years too early. We'll see. Um, but, but I think that, um, you start to look at the quality of some of these consumer crypto apps. Um, and the quality is now really on par with web two, like in an incredible way, like you log in with the regular login. Um, you don't need to on-ramp funds because all your gas is subsidized. Um, you can interact with crypto like it's anything else. Um, I think we're very, very nearly there. Um, and I think there, uh, in terms of the builders I'm talking to a lot, like there's a really strong consumer crypto renaissance where everyone sees, oh, wow, like now I can do things on chain that wasn't uh, possible before. Um, so I think this cycle is the cycle where we, I don't think it'll be the whole world using crypto yet, but I think it's the scenario where like the average person can sign up for a crypto app and not realize that it's crypto, but then they start to dig around in the details a little bit and they're like, oh, that's interesting. This gives me all these interesting properties. And then they, and then they, they, they start to learn more from there. I think we're nearly there. Awesome. And what about syndicate? Anything specific that you're cooking? Um, so we're thinking a lot about how to make these layer threes more useful. Um, one thing that we're very excited about is like, what kind of data can we bring to layer threes that they need? Um, so like, can we put Farcaster data on chain? 
Can we put um, like uh, cross chain data on chain? Like, can we like put like degen holders on L2 and mirror those to the L3 so that you know like all the holdings across both chains and you can aggregate them easily? Um, that's what we're thinking a lot about is like starting to chip away at what you talked about before the like um, interoperability of these chains, like starting to chip away um, with that in a in a small way. Um, we'll see. Uh, We'll see uh, uh, how um, how 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 far we get on it, but I think that it's something that that we're personally um yeah thinking quite a bit about. Sounds good. Well, we will check back with you in about five years to see if you're <laughs> correct on all your. Yes, questions. or maybe maybe it's next year. Maybe maybe the timing's finally right. <laughs> I did buy Girl Scout Amazing. cookies on chain, so in a frame. There you go. So yeah. with Dgen. Yeah. There you go. The front end for that was a lot, a lot smoother than the back end for that. That was uh, trying yeah, to get the girls sure. to take crypto. Um, some, some, uh, uh, not an easy task, but they did it. They did it. <laughs> they did. Yeah. They did it. They got they it done. It. I've told this mm -hmm. story a couple of times now, so people are probably sick of it. But I, I actually bought Girl Scout cookies at the Farcaster event in Denver, and I was standing there with Jesse, and he was like, "Here, come. You got to get some, some cookies." So I, I bought them with the Coinbase wallet, ten dollars USDC. They gave me the box. I turned around. Jesse was standing there, and he hands me a base management business card. He's like, "Here." Ten dollars USDC. <laughs> so I like, scanned the QR code and got the ten dollars back. So I was like, "All right, this is the future of finance." I love it. Amazing Free cookies. <laughs> Whereas yes. I bought Free my cookies. girl, exactly. I bought Girl Scout cookies with Dgen, and they they were I spent forty dollars at that time, Ooh. and that's ninety thousand Dgen. And at one point, it ended up at like the cookies were fifteen hundred dollars or something. So you know, you got your interesting. Pizza. Exactly. Most, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And I am not. I could not be happier. Believe me. Believe me. I still Going have there. some. I'm going to freeze the last box. We'll we'll see it uh, in a year. There you go. Amazing. B yes. Bitcoin pizza walked so that base, uh, you know, base girl so that cookies DGen, could run. DGen cookies could, could run. Yes, exactly. Base Thin Mints. Base Thin Mints. Base Thin Mints. Well, yeah, we well, can call it many things. <laughs> <laughs> I want to I want to thank you for jumping on with us. It's uh, it's been awesome. Uh, incidentally, we're actually chatting with uh, Noun Forty on Thursday for the pod too. So ah, we're getting uh, we're cool. getting the San Francisco contingent on this week. And, Amazing, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah so You're, really, uh, sandwiched really by cool great it. friends. I love it. Wonderful. <laughs> That's awesome. Very cool. Thank you so much for joining us, and we're going to be looking forward to seeing uh, what you and Syndicate are building in in the uh, days and, and months and years to come. Absolutely. Thanks so much. It's a lot of fun. 